We're in a series called Vision and Values. Vision and Values. There's a verse in the Bible, it's kind of famous, that says, where there is no vision, people perish. Another translation of that says, where there is no vision, people cast off restraint. They just go in every direction. So in the first week, we talked about how our vision is to create a space where people can find faith in God. Second week, or last week, we talked about our goal is to create a space where people can find friends. And today I want to talk about how we want to create a space for people to find their future. When I first came to Calvary uh, quite a few years ago, um, there actually was a vision statement. It was printed on every bulletin, and it went something like this. Calvary Assembly is a hospital for people to find health, healing, and wholeness. Sounds kind of good, huh? No? <laughs> so I went to our church leadership and I asked if we could take it off the bulletin for a while and re-examine our vision statement. And they, and they asked me why. And I, I asked them a set of questions. I said, let me ask you, who wants to go to the hospital? Nobody. I said, and, and the only reason you go to a hospital is because you have to, right? And then as soon as you feel better, what do you do? You leave, which might have explained <laughs> our church back then because we had less than 20 people. And so you only went when you absolutely had to, and as soon as you felt better, you went someplace else. It was kind of that. So we actually spent over a year praying and talking, seeking God. What do you want our church family to be? How do you want us to go about what you've called us to do? And out of that came this idea that we are a safe place, because there's not a lot of places in our world that are safe. A safe place to find faith, friends, and your future. In Ephesians, the third chapter, the 20th verse, it says, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is, and this is the surprise. It doesn't say that is at work for us. It says that is at work in us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Continuing on into Ephesians chapter 4. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So Christ himself gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The main point I want to make today is the whole body of Christ works when the whole body of Christ works. That church is its best when we all have a sense of not just that we belong to Jesus and not just that we belong to each other because that helps us to feel good, but now we want to make a difference. That's a really big deal. So the Apostle Paul actually starts this concept in, in Ephesians 4 by talking about the things that are universally true. These things are the same for every single believer. This is what he starts talking about. In the Christian faith, some things are the same for everyone. So there is one body. There's one church. Lots of different denominations. Lots of different styles. Lots of different traditions. One church. And it's not which one is right or which one is wrong. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you put your trust and your faith in him, you are part of his church. How many are glad you are part of his church today? Is that good news? It really is. 
There is one Holy Spirit. He's the one that assures us of our salvation and empowers us to do something beyond our own capacity. There is one hope, and that hope is in Jesus. He's the one who paid the price for our redemption. There is one Lord. Lord just means the one who calls the shots, who sets the direction. Jesus is the leader of his church. There is one faith. It is in Christ alone, not in our efforts, not in our resources, not in our reputation. There is one baptism. I know there are different ways to be baptized, but there's only one baptism into the body of Christ. You're not baptized into sectarian spiritual clubs. You're baptized into the body of Christ. There is one God and Father of all. It doesn't matter what your heritage is. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. It doesn't matter what your zip code is. It doesn't matter what your education is. It doesn't matter what your income earning potential is. Every single one of those things is the same for every single person, regardless of the generation they were born in or where they live geographically. Every single one of those things is the same. But Jesus or Paul now starts talking about ways that our faith is unique to us. So there are some things that are the same, but some things are unique for every Christian. And Paul focuses on the things we have in common first, and then he starts focusing on how God gives his grace or Christ gives his grace in, in proportion to, our, to what he's calling us to do. So this is a big deal. And this is really interesting. It isn't just one gift. And some people get it and somebody, it's not just one gift and everybody gets it. I've heard people try to relegate spirituality and salvation to just a single gift and then everything else comes along with it. But this passage indicates, and several others in the New Testament, that there are specific and unique capacities that Christ gives, that God the Father gives, that the Holy Spirit gives. It's not just one gift. Every person gets some spiritual gifts, not the same spiritual gifts. Every person gets some spiritual gifts, not the same spiritual gifts. The goal of Christianity is not to make everybody the same. You can breathe a sigh of relief. I am not here to make you like me. One of me is more than enough. I'm not here to make you like someone else I saw. God has created us each unique. Every single human being has a different fingerprint. If God has that much capacity for uniqueness, he wants us to celebrate that rather than try to regulate it out of the church. And so there are differences of opinions. There are differences of taste. There are differences of style. I mean, we're a less liturgical church in terms of kind of traditional uh, service or options. Some churches are more liturgical. How many are glad that God's not outside of any of the churches just going, if they would just change that one thing, then I could finally get in there. It's not how it works. The goal in Christianity is not to make everyone the same. That's the goal in cults. There's something about the human heart that is attracted to uniformity. When you see everybody doing the same thing in the same way, that is attractive to us. And it's one of the reasons why people try to impose that in spirituality. But when you try to impose that, rather than celebrating the diversity, but trying to get uniformity, what you wind up with is not unity. What you wind up is this, this uniformity. And that, that does a lot of damage to a lot of people while it impresses a lot of people around us. It's a really unhealthy approach. So God creates different gifts, and the Holy Spirit distributes them as he desires. And no one gets all the gifts because that would make that person, they would be tempted to isolation. They would be tempted to become intolerant of other people. In fact, they would become insufferable. So we're going to go over a list of gifts, and this is not an exhaustive list. These are gifts that are listed in three spaces, places in, in Scripture. And so this is a very aerial view, but just to give us a sense this morning, spiritual gifts uh, are different, and so are the people of God. This is a really big deal. The gifts are different, and God's people are different too. The church is not a mass production line. That's not how it works. 
And in the Old Testament, there were three basic categories of people that God used. There were prophets, there were priests, and there were kings. Prophets, priests, and kings. That's, that's the basic people that God used for hundreds and hundreds of years in human history. Prophets were people who could discern trends and trajectories, and then they called people to repentance, to rethink the options that they were exercising. Their language was often urgent and quite direct. They didn't apologize for making anyone feel uncomfortable. They wanted people to avoid unnecessary pain and embrace divine opportunity. And so they were real clear about their mission. And that's the prophet. And then there were priests. And priests kind of helped bring understanding to people of what God's word meant. They would hear confessions and help people reconnect to God through sacrifices. And they would offer blessings and release the goodness of God into people's life. That was the priest. And then there were kings. And kings would amass resources for the common good. They would administrate very ambitious projects where the goal was to increase the safety of the citizens of that nation and to promote the welfare of the citizens of that nation. They tended to be strong personalities. They had the capacity to pull people together. And what I'd like to suggest is this is actually a great picture. It's a great picture of not just three offices that God used, but three personalities, three different kinds of of people. There's the prophet. There are some people who just tend to be a little bit stronger, unyielding. They consider it their job to make declarations and let everybody know what the truth is. They can pride themselves on being truth tellers, but their bedside manner often leaves a lot to be desired. They can be unwilling to listen to counsel. They just want to get the truth out there. They tend to, to have a stick ready to draw a line in the sand. And then they'll whack you for being on the wrong side of the line. It's like that. Uh, they struggle with patience. You know, this is the day the Lord has made. Make a decision today. Who are you going to follow? And uh, they tend to see weakness as rebellion. They're, un, they're, they're very comfortable giving correction. They tend to struggle with taking it. That's the personality of a person who's kind of a prophet oriented personality. And then there are priest-oriented personalities. These people tend to be better listeners. They try to understand. They show a little more patience. They comfort other people. They pride themselves in being a very caring person. They're very concerned about the well-being of others. Um, they do tend to avoid conflict that makes them uncomfortable. They can shrink back from challenging someone who's walking in unhealthy or destructive ways. They can be guilty of pleasing people above preaching truth. So they just, they wanna be friends with everybody. Uh, they are uncomfortable giving correction. Their tendency is to believe, well, it's just a season. It's not really a sin, it's a season they're in and they'll grow out of it. You know? That's kind of the, priest mentality. And then the king mentality. The king is very leadership fo focused, this personality. He's interested in doing big things. They pride themselves in getting others to support a vision or a mission or a project. They, they don't tolerate conflict. A, a person who has more of a kingly style personality, you might hear them say something like this. You can get off the train you can get on the train. You can lay down on the tracks in front of the train. This train is going to move no matter what. And like that, that's that personality. They can be threatened by different ideas or other strong personalities. They're not used to negotiating. It's often, you, you'll hear this phrase too, my way or the... You've heard that, see? There, there's some kingly personalities around. They're not typically known for their patience. If people do what they say and it works, it proves that they were right. Every person, please hear this, every person brings their personality traits to the use of their spiritual gifts. So not only are the gifts different, 
the personalities that are using them are different. So I'm going to give examples because I, I don't want to, anyone to feel singled out. So I'll focus on pastors. Right? You can have a pastor whose personality is more like that of a prophet. A pastor with that personality tends to deliver very strong messages, regularly challenges people's unhealthy choices. They can be a little bit harsh. They can be a little bit demanding. They can come across as uncaring. They see their job primarily as the declaration of truth. And once they have done their job, their work is done. That's kind of the prophet-oriented pastor. Uh, you can have a pastor who, their personality is more like a priest, a little bit more of a counselor. They, they tend to be good listeners and counselors. They're known for their patience and their gentle manner. They, they can avoid calling people uh, out of sin or challenging unhealthy behavior. They see their job as caring for the hurting. Uh, they may not know what to do with healthy people or strong people. Uh, th those, <laughs> in fact, they, those individuals might get ignored a little bit more. That's a pastor who's more like a priest. And then there's pastors who can be more like a king. Uh, first of all, they tend to make sure everyone knows they're in charge. They might even have a special seat that signifies that to everybody in the room, just in case you're new. Uh, they make sure everyone knows who's in charge and they give directives. They're, they're not so much interested in conversations or feedback. Uh, they tend to be vision-centric. They're project-oriented. They, they care more about the project than they do for people who are making it happen. They can bring order and efficiency, but they often leave a trail of tears behind them. They can develop a double standard. There's one for them and their entourage, and then one for everybody else. They can behave like a celebrity, and they can carry a sense of entitlement. This isn't just true for pastoral ministries. This is true for every spiritual gift that we can release. There's the gift, but then it works through our personality. When people are equipped to use their spiritual gifts, the body of Christ the church, Paul says three things happen. One is they're built up. People become stronger and healthier. When we, when we use our spiritual gifts, work together, people become stronger and healthier. Secondly, people grow in their confidence. People grow in their confidence. They, they grow in their confidence to trust God's word and they grow in their confidence regarding their role in the world. And then the goal, the goal is not to break people up or break them down. The goal is to build them up. And then the third thing is that they're unified. They're unified. Unity is not sameness. It's not trying to make everyone the same. Unity is bringing our differences together to collaborate on a common mission. Different people with different gifts collaborating and cooperating. And here's what we need to know about this. When you're walking in unity, I don't have to get my way as long as God gets his way. That's the really big deal. So there's, there's, the body is built up, the body is unified, the body is also matured. And maturity is the ability to be aware of our responsibilities, our, our abilities, and our opportunities. Immature people don't know what they're capable of. Immature people don't know when the time is right. Immature people struggle to see their role. And as we grow up in faith, we tend to get a sense, this is why I'm here. This is what I can do. Maturity isn't independence from others. It's interdependence with others. We need each other. Maturity takes into consideration the personality differences, and it grows beyond the natural limitations and liabilities that we can have as prophets, as priests, and as kings. When each part of Christ's body, the church, does their part, everyone benefits. So this is what's interesting. I actually think, I actually think that there are gifts specific that God the Father gives. I think that there are gifts that Jesus the Son gives, and I think there are gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. Say, so, well, why would you think that? Because in, in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, the fourth verse, it says there are different kinds of gifts, okay? 
but the same, and the next word is spirit, distributes them. Next verse, there are different kinds of service. It's another way of saying gifts, but the same Lord, Jesus is the Lord. There are different kinds of working. It's another word for gifts, but in all of them, in everyone, it is the same God at work. You can actually find these in scriptures. In Romans 12, there are specific gifts that says that, that God the Father gives. And by the way, what's interesting about these gifts is you tend to get these gifts before you draw your first breath into your body. You're born with these gifts and they tend to stay with you your whole life, even if you never become a follower of Jesus. God is so unbelievably generous that he makes investments into every single human being before they draw their first breath. And they're listed here. And the first one says uh, prophecy. So how can a person prophesy if they don't know God? Or how can they be born with that tendency? And it's the ability to diagnose current situations and call people to healthy options. And we can see that not only in religious environments, but in lots of other environments as well. You don't have to say more or try to make it sound more important. You just use the measure of faith that God gives you. And then serving, to come alongside and assist others in accompanying them. There are people, they don't want to be the front person. They want to be the support person. They like coming alongside and helping others complete their vision or their missions or their projects. And then there are teachers who like to make something understandable and provide pragmatic steps. Uh, every year I get an annual physical and one of the doctors I see, I do the same thing every year. I come with a question and it's not because I'm really interested in the answer. It's because I like what I see when I ask him a question. He gets so excited. He sits down on a stool. He rolls it up beside me. He takes his prescription pad and turns it over. He takes out a pencil and he starts drawing me diagrams and labeling things and explaining. This is a person who isn't just a doctor. They also have a teaching capacity. He wants to make it simple, make it pragmatic, help me to understand. There are people who are natural encouragers. They come alongside somebody else who feels timid and they pour courage into them so that they feel like they're able to try something they wouldn't have tried without them. And then there are people who have giving gifts. They find ways to release resources generously. That's not just believers, by the way. There are people who are incredibly generous in our world. They set up all kinds of foundations and they release unbelievable amounts of wealth. Where do you think that capacity came from? They were born with that capacity. God gave them that capacity. And then there's leadership. It's the ability to cast vision, uh, to, to enlist support, to accomplish meaningful projects, to organize human resources. We need leaders in our world. And there are some people, they're natural leaders. You can spot it in them at six years old. You put them on the playground and they don't want to just do random things. Let's get together. Let's play a game. Let's get sides. Let's have a goal. Let's set some rules. Come on, let's do this together. They just, they have that capacity. And then there's kindness. That means that you give aid to people who are in distress. It's not just being nice. You find a way to assist people who are in distress. All of these are given by God and they're true your whole life. We've all been in a room with someone who had a teacher title, but they didn't have a teaching gift. That's tough to take. We've all experienced what it's like when someone who has been given the title of making sure that resources are spent to help other people, but their tendency is to reserve and hold them back. Tough to take. It's not about titles. It's this investment that God has made. And then in Ephesians 4, the passage we just read, these are the gifts given by Jesus, God's son. And he says he gives apostles. These are people who are called to expand the church by taking the church into places that it has not been before, raising up leaders and planting churches in those areas. Prophets, people who tell the truth and call people to repentance. That's a little bit different from the gift of prophecy we'll talk about in a minute. Evangelists share the words of Jesus and the works of Jesus so that people can see who Jesus really is. Pastors, these are shepherds who lead and feed the flock. The word pastor literally means shepherd. Someone who leads the flock and feeds the flock. Teachers, people who explain God's word in a way that people can understand and respond to. These are gifts of the Son. In 1 Corinthians 12, these are gifts given by God the Holy Spirit. By the way, the first gifts you're kind of born with. The second gifts, when you're born again, Jesus just gives some people these gifts 
and he wants them to operate in that way to help equip others to use their spiritual gifts. And then in 1 Corinthians 12, we have a set of gifts that seem to not be permanent. They're temporary. In fact, they're, they're only available as needed. You, you don't get one of these gifts and then own it for the rest of your life. And so in 1 Corinthians 12, these are temporary gifts. There's the gift of wisdom. Wisdom just means your capacity to solve a problem based on the insight that was given to you. Knowledge, understanding how things work or something that has happened that has created the situation that we're dealing with. Faith. Faith is an unshakable confidence that these steps that we are taking are essential and they will work. It's a remarkable thing. Healing, which is recovery from sickness as well as damage done through unhealthy behaviors. Miracles. They're divine interventions that seem to bypass the natural laws or the natural order of things and their tendencies to bring freedom and provision to people. Prophecy. This is this gift is a little bit different than the office of a prophet. Prophecy, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14, that when prophecy is given like this, it's words that build people up, it stirs people up, and it brings freedom from pain and discomfort in their life. Discernment of spirits. It's not just discernment, discernment of spirits the insight to know what forces are driving situations and behaviors. Tongues, which is a personal, private, spiritual language that enables a person to pray beyond their ability. You're not limited by what you know. You can actually pray by what God knows. It's a really cool concept. Interpretation of tongues, so that if that occurs in a public gathering, that everyone would benefit from knowing what those words mean. All of these gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, are activated through prayer. You don't get the gift of wisdom and now you're the wise being that everyone comes to for the rest of your life. It's not how it works. God doesn't use you to bring healing to someone and now you can heal anyone you want. It's not how it works. These are temporary provisions, gifts that, the, that God uses us to be the delivery person for. It's a really cool concept. The goal of spiritual gifts is not to call attention to ourselves, but to Jesus. The discovery of spiritual gifts requires some self-assessment. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come out and some self and, and some experimentation. We have to think about ourselves, how we're made, what's true about us, and then we have to try some experiments. Most people are far too passive when it comes to their spiritual gifts. They're waiting for someone else to identify what their gift is and then enlist them in some specific activity for its release. It's not how Paul talked about it to Timothy. He said, there's a gift that's in you. You need to fan that into flame. You need to take some responsibility for that. You need to step into what God has placed in your life and make sure somebody else benefits because of it. Now, you can operate outside of your primary gift. Spiritual gifts are not meant to be specialization. Well, I, I have the gift of pastoring. I, I don't give. No, no, no. Not how it works. I have the gift of prophecy. I don't need wisdom. <laughs> oh, yes, you do. that we come to this concept where we dare to believe God has invested something in us and we're dare, we dare to try to see how he can use it. Some people are far too passive. Others are a little bit too pushy. They demand the opportunity even if they haven't proven their capacity or their character. Um, I've, I've had people come into our church and say, God told me I'm supposed to preach next Sunday. And I just tell them, I did not get that memo. <laughs> you, should, you should talk to God about that. Somebody dropped the ball. God told me I'm supposed to lead the worship team. <laughs> not everybody who wants to should. Some voices should not be amplified. Just, that's all I'll say. 
Here's one of the fascinating things is that in our experiments, we begin to not just discover the gifts that God has given to us, but we begin to learn things that, that grow us in ways that offset the negative tendencies of our own personalities. That we need people who are truth tellers, but they need to speak the truth in love. We need people who hear confessions and offer blessings, but they also need to provide the kind of truth that changes the trajectory of a person, not just makes them feel good in the one that they're on. We need people who are leaders and martial resources and amass human capacity in order that something can be accomplished, but every single person who's doing it also matters, not just the project. Here's the reason. You cannot grow without activating your spiritual gift and serving others. You can learn more, but you will not grow. If you, if you don't know what your gifts are and you're not serving in any capacity, you can remember more biblical facts. You can take and collect all your notes, but something inside of you will always be limited. Uh, when I went into high school, I couldn't swim. They didn't just show me a video and give me a lesson from a teacher in the front of the room saying, this is how you do a breaststroke, this is how you do a freestyle, this is how you do a backstroke. I could watch all of those, I could read the text that talk about them, but that doesn't mean that I know how to swim. You have to get into the water. And then when you're doing something that needs adjustment, you have to let someone speak into your life. And because of that, when I went into high school, I couldn't swim a stroke. And when I left high school, I was a certified water safety instructor and a lifeguard. Not because I watched a video. Because I got into the water. How does God want you to get into the water? You will not grow without it. When we use our spiritual gifts, we demonstrate God's love and we demonstrate our love. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, um, we so desperately need not just to know that you love us or that we belong. We need to know why we are here and discovery of that spiritual gift and, and putting it into action to serve others answers so many of those questions. Our faith becomes something quite remarkable when we act on it. So I ask that you would help every single person in this place be willing to start an incredible, adventurous journey of discovering who you've made them to be and what gifts you've placed in their, in their life and to be able to exercise those gifts in a way that help others to see your love and their care as well. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.